David said, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Father, we pray that as we gather now to meditate and study the Holy Scriptures, that the Spirit of God will minister this word unto every heart. For while we know that we have been redeemed, yet except we walk in light, as you have given us light, and as you give us light, then the world will not know what light is, because there is no light in this world except we be light shining in this wicked, perverse, crooked generation. So grant that the word of light might be beacons shining through each of us. Let the Spirit of God take us deeper into the things that we need to know and be in this hour. For we have the witness within ourselves, not only that we are the children of God, but that, the, that Jesus Christ, who has redeemed us by his blood, stands at the very threshold to return and to catch us up and then prepare us for his kingdom. So grant that in this hour, this morning, we might press deeper into the things of the Spirit, become better witnesses of that light who himself came to give us light and life, even Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, turn with us then to Matthew 5. I'm going to take up where I left off last time. Trust you have your Bibles because uh, you're going to need them. Matthew chapter 5. I'm not going to digress and say some things that we've said before as we've been teaching in this area of the Sermon on the Mount, except to say, if you don't know what it is, these three chapters contain the principles of the deeper life in the Spirit, which uh, is the subject of what we consider probably the most important book on the shelf, because it you say, well, I thought faith was the most important in your ministry. Well, faith is in here. Uh, you can't walk this life apart from faith. And we show you the relationship between faith and the, and the crucified life. And so the Sermon on the Mount sets forth the principles of the deeper life in the Spirit. God has not baptized us in the Spirit just to get together and do what we did for an hour, praise and sing and worship. And some of you who came late missed the best part. <clears throat> but um, uh, that, that is a result of receiving the baptism, but it isn't the end. The end is to bring us into a place of total crucifixion with Christ. Now, if you say, do you mean that literally? I mean it literally. I mean what he means when he says, take up the cross and follow me. Now, you don't take up a cross, you know, to go uh, stand it in a corner somewhere. You don't take up a cross. A cross isn't something you take up and put around your neck. A cross is something you die on. And if you follow Jesus, we talk about following him, I'll go where you want me to go. Well, he said, if you follow me, you have to go where I went, and that's to Calvary. Now, I recognize that uh, such statements are rather stern to a lot of people who've never heard of anything in the terms of Christianity as uh, except join church, get baptized, and sit, and we'll preach to you. You become a spectator and a participant in the program. But discipleship is something entirely different from what you've heard in your Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, whatever kind of church you're in or out of. And uh, I've preached it for going on 22 years now. I never could get anybody to believe it. And then God himself established a work in Winona Lake, and this is kind of the result of it. It isn't anything I've done or anything anyone does. It's not anything you've done. It's what we're all being, what we're all doing as he uses us. I can't get into the high school, the college, the seminary, uh, 
somebody's home or the place of business where you work, but you can. And uh, so I don't go around telling people, come and see what I've done. I just say, come and, and uh, have your eyes open to what charismatic body ministry is all about. Uh, <clears throat> but God raised up a work and began to send people in who would listen to a message concerning total commitment, total discipleship. And this is what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. It's, it sets forth how you are to live. It's not something for the past or future, but how you are to live today in a sinful world under grace. And you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. Uh, when I first started teaching this uh, a few weeks ago, and we come back to it as we come back to uh, Faith Assembly to minister, so there are gaps, but... When we started teaching this, I said all I would have to do is read certain verses in here and you'd have to have a Bible before you to really believe they're there. Because you'd think I was mad at you or trying to bind you with something. Uh, like when someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other. That's what it says. And if a man takes your coat, give him your cloak also. And lend and don't even ask for anything in return. And he has a whole lot to say about not taking an oath. And, uh, well, shall we go on? You know, it's all there. And so <clears throat> you can't live this apart from the Holy Spirit. People just read the Sermon on the Mount. Right away they've got to put it in some other dispensation because it's just too much. Without the Holy Spirit it will always be too much. And so <clears throat> this sets forth the principles of how the disciple who's willing to make total commitment will govern his life as opposed to the shallow Christian who's satisfied with well being saved sitting in a pew and uh, thinks he's fulfilling his obligations when he pays someone else to function for him religiously that's what you call a clergyman <laughs> there isn't a word in the Bible that you pay anyone to do your witnessing for you or praying for you are having your faith for you, are visiting the sick for you. God doesn't call men to knock on doors. He calls men to pray and to get into the Word and minister the Word to you so that you can function and minister. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says that. That He set the ministry in the church to prepare the body for its ministry. Well, praise God, I don't have to convince most of the people here. You just have to kind of get out of the way and... Give them room. <laughs> Give them room. Amen. It's a, it's a real privilege not to have to be pastor of a church any longer where you have to pump people up with a program. When they're filled with the Spirit and you teach the Word, I'll tell you, friends, you just have to get out of the way. That's what I tell people. Where we go? We don't have a program for the young people here. And I said, I think most of the people who come are under 35. We're all young. But uh, some of us confess, some of us don't have to confess to being young. Some of us do, but as you confess, you possess. And praise God, you don't, you can't, you can't plan what God is doing. And this filled up congregation this morning is nothing. I mean, you have to go out and see what's going on at the barn and see what's going on around everywhere. This is just where we gather, some of us, for Sunday morning and evening. This isn't what God's doing. We're just here to worship. <laughs> what God's doing is every day. You just can't, you just can't plan what He's doing. Where I saw that brother with a beard, is he here today? Well, I thought he was here. No, no, Jim, it was Mel. What's the matter? Didn't he get in? Oh, he had to go back. Well, praise the Lord. So if you haven't visited the barn, you ought to visit the barn and uh, see what goes on in this area. This is God. And so God is looking for people who will no longer explain away the Word, but who will get into the Word and accept it as valid for today. Don't you let the church are the devil talk you out of the righteousness of the Sermon on the Mount because it is valid for this dispensation. It's valid. Its validity began the moment Jesus spoke it. 
Now, I recognize that if anyone's ever been to Sunday school, they've read it. But I, I submit that, that there are very few. In fact, I've never run into anyone, really, that I can recall offhand who teaches that it's valid for today outside uh, the one speaking to you. Now, it doesn't mean others do not believe it or teach it, but I just haven't found them. But if you can find a single principle in here that is not valid for today, then I want you to tell me after what it is, because you shan't find it. On the contrary, Jesus takes the Old Testament and said, you have heard in all time that you should love your friends and hate your enemies, but I say unto you, you see, he brings it right up to date, I say unto you to love your enemies. Do good to them that persecute you. Pray for them that speak against you and so forth. And he does this over and over. You have heard in the old time thus and so, but he says, I say unto you. And you can't find a single principle in these three chapters, and I mean these three chapters will keep you busy the rest of your life. That's how much is there. But you won't find a single principle that isn't taught all through the New Testament. Some of it almost worded exactly like Jesus said. Paul in Romans 12, for example, the last of the chapter says the same thing that Jesus says about loving your enemies. He says, don't return evil for evil. Return good for evil. And so forth. So <clears throat> these are valid principles. Are, are you able to live the righteousness of the Sermon on the Mount? You need Christ. You need the Holy Spirit to do it. And he opened his mouth saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. We've already covered the first three Beatitudes. We're going to go right on this morning. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, I could just wish all of you would come and hear the whole sermon because there are things in here that, that will revolutionize your life and thinking if you'll just uh, be consistent and be here each time that is taught. Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why are you blessed if you're poor in spirit? You know, uh, looks like you'd be blessed if you were rich in spirit. <laughs> well, he says if you're poor in spirit, you get a reward. You get the kingdom of heaven. And why are you blessed if you're poor in spirit? Because you recognize your spiritual poverty, Amen. that you need uh, something in the spiritual realm, that you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, people say sometimes, why do I need the Holy Spirit? And I always say that's the same as asking, what do I need with God? What do I need with more of God? If he's promised the Holy Spirit, then receive whatever he's promised for you by faith. And so being poor in spirit is recognizing that you are spiritually bankrupt until Christ does something. And secondly, after he does his work in you, it's recognizing you are still poverty stricken spiritually and that you need the person of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you to empower you, to enable you to walk in victory 365 days a year. Well, we've said all about that then secondly he said blessed are they that mourn once you recognize your spiritual poverty without Christ or without the baptism of the Holy Spirit without his work in you it should cause you to mourn I mean I'll tell you I mourned for 14 years I didn't know what I was crying about but I was missing this empowering of the Holy Spirit I mourned and of course there's more to the mourning than that it's mourning for the f because of the fact you have to live like Lot in the midst of sinful Sodom. And uh, no, no Christian, no spirit-filled Christian especially, can really say he's happy uh, in Sodom. And that you are waiting for Jesus and his righteousness to be manifested. And mourning, mourning about the present state of the church when it is in Revelation 3 called the Laodicean period when the church is rich, filled with prosperity, millions of dollars being poured into programs, has the membership, it has everything in the visible realm that, that it could need or want, and Jesus says of it, you are poor and wretched and naked and blind and don't even know it. And so we should mourn because that <clears throat> the average Christian today has no interest in the deeper things of God. And will oppose the Holy Spirit, all you have to do is just mention, for example, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the average church. And you can create confusion and terror and uh, a reaction that, uh, well, it's like crying fire in a, in a closed building. Uh, mourn because of those things. And then blessed, he said, 
are the meek. Now, we've covered these three, of course, but I'm just bringing you up today. Meekness is not to be identified with weakness. Uh, I, I have great respect for a meek person, but I find it very hard to have any respect for a weak person. I mean in the, in the spiritual sense now. Moses is called the meekest man on the face of the earth in Numbers 12, but he certainly wasn't weak. He wouldn't defend himself against his accusers. And yet, in the case of the golden calf incident, you see what he did there. He was not a, not a weak man, but he was meek. The promise here, notice each of the Beatitudes has a promise. promise. If you are mourning, you'll be comforted. If you are meek, you will inherit the earth. See, Jesus Christ is getting ready to restore to us our inheritance. What Adam lost in the fall, he's going to restore to his children. And the requirements for you to inherit the earth will be that you are meek. Now, we don't have time this morning, nor when I taught on this did we get into it, about the fact he says we will inherit the earth. Now, if you've belonged to any churches I know of, you've probably been taught that the earth is not something you want to inherit and that we're all going to be taken to heaven and all of that. But uh, he said the meek here will get the earth. Hmm, how about that? And so <laughs> that kind of goes along with Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 3, 21 and 22, that all things belong to the Christian including the world, he said, is ours. You didn't know that. I'll tell you, dear friends, there's going to be quite a radical change made in this earth before it's given back to us, but it's going to be ours. And Jesus Christ is going to reign and rule on this earth for a thousand years, as the scriptures clearly teach. Over and over, from Genesis to Revelation, you have promises of a millennial reign one day of... Uh, God with his people, God ruling over his people. You couldn't even read the book of Isaiah without seeing it scores of times taught. The same truth, and <clears throat> all through the word of God. The whole book of Zechariah teaches about the millennium. Fourteen chapters of the prophecy of Zechariah. Even people, good Baptists and others who do not believe in a literal reign of Christ on earth, say that, that when you get to Zechariah, they don't know what to do with it. And when they get to the fourteenth chapter, they could just have wished that it hadn't been written uh, because it really knocks their theory of no literal reign on earth that the kingdom of God is in you and that's all the kingdom you'll ever see you'll never see a visible kingdom 14th chapter of Zechariah uh, just knocks their theory into a cocked hat uh, because they admit they said if it means what it says then, it, then this is what's going to happen uh, these are <coughs> these are things truths that we've taught this church for years so we're not going to digress to prove to you that the saints who are overcomers in this area will inherit the earth. They will reign and rule with Christ. And one of the conditions for ruling is going to be your meek, that you're meek, because God is not going to restore the kingdom or the earth to those who are now ruling and those who rule by power or wisdom or might and who demonstrate their ability through strength and that sort of thing but the leaders in the kingdom will be the servants of those whom they serve Amen. now that doesn't make any sense to the mentality of present day churchianity but that's Matthew 20 and that's uh, Philippians 2 and so on where Jesus said he that's going to be ruler will be the servant of those whom he rules he said you want to be master then he says you'll be a servant. And so the greatest calling is not to be a leader, but to be a servant. And when you are able to fulfill that function as you should, then you are the greatest leader. Now, some of you have ambitions about the church. Or you notice there are no offices in this church, so you'd be in the wrong church if you, wanted, if you had any ambitions. But if you have any ambitions religiously or spiritually, uh, they'll never, you'll never realize the, the rulership in the kingdom with Christ as long as you have them. 
You go home sometime and read Matthew 20. All right, we've covered that. Now he says, blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now what's the promise? They'll be filled. You'll get exactly what you're seeking for. Now if you're hungering and thirsting after something in this world, whether it's religious or spiritual or material, then all right, you can have that. You can go as high as you want in the average church if you're willing to get busy enough. But if you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, that's what he's going to give you. I mean, the basic purpose for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit today is not so that you can speak in tongues. That's the evidence of the baptism. <clears throat> but in order to bring into us, bring us into the place where we are filled with righteousness and holiness and truth to work in us this, this longing for righteousness. Now, without the Holy Spirit, you can't really have that hunger and thirst. And I'm not saying there aren't exceptions to anything that we say. I'm talking about what the rule is, not the exception. People sometimes come after when you're talking about some subject and try to give you an exception. They haven't proven a thing because we'll leave room for exceptions that there can be people who are hungering and thirsting for something and don't know what they're thirsting for. Uh, I did that for 14 years. But <clears throat> this deep hunger and thirst is what characterizes a person who receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For example, where you went to church because you know why you went. You were either searching for something you weren't getting or you did it as a chore or a duty. Now, you may not have told yourself that, but, but I'm talking... Not criticizing you, but talking out of experience. That in our Baptist churches, you read the Bible, I'll tell you why. Either as a duty or, and you were let know that you better read it as a duty, or you did it to be 100% Christian that Sunday. We had six points. We called it a six-point record system. If you didn't read your daily Bible readings, you were just a 90% Christian. I always wondered... They had one on there, you know, have you given to offering? That was 10%. I think reading your Bible was 20% and so on. And I always wondered what the poor Christians did. Of course, I know now that you don't have to be a poor Christian, but that was before the baptism. I always wondered what the poor Christians did who had nothing to put in the offering. Since that was worth 10% in our Baptist churches, in our Sunday school class, you checked off what you'd done, 10 church, read your Bible, given offering and so forth, studied your lesson. And I always wondered what a poor Christian did if he didn't have anything put in the offering. He may be more sincere than the fellow who was 100%, but he could never be more than a 90% Christian. And so, bless your heart, if you have had our experience, and you have, there's nobody here that hasn't had it or is still having it, where Bible reading was a duty or a chore, and that was your reward, now, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we, like David, love the Word, and we hunger and thirst after righteousness. David said, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the way of sinners. And then in verse 2, he goes on to say, His delight, not his chore or duty to fulfill some requirement, maybe to his conscience or the church or something, but his delight is in the Word of the Lord. And in his word, he meditates day and night. Now listen, dear friends, any of you here can join a church and read the Bible and serve in some organization or on some committee and you can be so busy that you can't keep up. Anybody can do that, but only the Holy Spirit can work in you a hunger and thirst Amen. after righteousness. We're talking about a hunger and thirst. And you can't be filled until you know you're hungry. I mean, are we talking to anybody out there you can't be filled until you know you're hungry the churches are just filled with people who don't know that they're hungry and thirsty and they're poor and naked and uh, have need of more because the institutional system has them so busy with a program that they don't have time to realize that they have nothing that they're empty you see and they're saying what do we need with the Holy Spirit well if I did any more I, 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 my wife would divorce me in the church. I, I'm not home half the time now and that sort of thing. We're not talking about religious busyness. We're talking about a hunger and thirst after righteousness. And so many, 
The institutional system has so many things for you to do now. As one brother said, if the Holy Spirit left the church tomorrow, 95% of the work and program would go right on. As they'd never miss him. Because it's so well oiled, so well organized, so supported with millions of dollars in funds, the system is so well uh, organized and planned and programmed that the Holy Spirit isn't functioning anyway. And if he left, they'd never miss him. Now, my friends, I'm talking about when you've got twenty, thirty dollars, million dollars poured into just one missions and a program and all sorts of buildings and institutions functioning, you may not be winning any converts, but you can stay so busy that you don't see the need of the power of the Holy Spirit. But when you've got nothing but the Holy Spirit and depending upon Him, then you'll see the difference in, in needing the power and having a program. And I want to say <clears throat> that, that missions are not fulfilling their function. They are a failure, and anyone with, with uh, a third-grade education can't even debate that point. Uh, we don't even have time to go into it, but I've heard too many and read too many uh, laments of the missionaries who say we spend years on the field and make sometimes one or two dubious converts. Now, I don't care what missions you're talking about. If it isn't charismatic, it cannot make converts. Like one missionary in India said, we've been here 30 years. I haven't seen a single convert. When I taught in the seminary, I listened with my own ears. One said, we've been in India 10 years. We think we may have made two converts. Ten years and millions of dollars. And one man with the anointing of the Holy Spirit can see literally thousands converted to Jesus Christ. He doesn't have anything but the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the faith to demonstrate what he believes and open blind eyes and see the sick healed. That'll do more to convince people that God's alive than your big uh, shining edifice with a $50,000 pipe organ and stained glass windows. Uh, it's a little incongruous anyway in some of these lands where we take our denominational ideas over there and try to convert people to a program. Uh, just go in the power of the Spirit. Well, I guess we're saying all of that because it has to fit in somewhere. We got to say that, that there's a difference between hungering and thirsting after righteousness and just being busy. And some people don't know they're hungry and thirsty or that they should be hungering and thirsting. They don't know they're empty because they're so busy, you see. And so <clears throat> the promise is that if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we're going to get what we're seeking for, righteousness. Now, if you don't want righteousness, of course, then you won't get it. But if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, he says he'll give you that, the exact thing you seek. Now, if a person's hungry, he doesn't want to see pictures in the Good Housekeeping magazine about food. I mean, that isn't going to satisfy him. Uh, if he's thirsty, he doesn't want a lecture on the chemistry of water. He wants the very thing that he needs. Amen. And I don't know about you, but if you're hungering and thirsting after more of God, that's what he promises you. God. You just keep hungering and thirsting. He says you'll be filled. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and not be filled with God. Uh, you, can, you can have as much of God as you're willing for him to manifest through you. And then he says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Where do you suppose Jesus got all of these ideas? He's telling you, friends, what Christian character is all about. Mercy. Now he's dealing, before he's been dealing with inward character, now he's dealing with our relationship to others. You can't be merciful to yourself, but you can to others. The next beatitude is blessed are the peacemakers, you see. Or net blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. This is our relationship to God. Blessed are the peacemakers. This is our relationship to others, you see. So now he's moved out of inward things, poor in spirit, the meek, they that mourn, <clears throat> they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now he's moving out to our, to our relationships to others. Blessed are the merciful. Now mercy is just... Another word, really, for grace, or, or to say it differently, it's an expression of grace. Mercy isn't justice. Mercy isn't just treating others fairly. Mercy is grace, and you can bestow grace upon people just as God can bestow grace upon you. 
Paul tells us in Titus that God had mercy on us. You see, the scriptures tell us God didn't deal with us according to our sins, but he was merciful. You see, if he was just, if he was J-U-S-T, just, as the courts of the land are supposed to be just, as you've been taught to be just to one another, you know, and do, uh, uh, go halfway with anyone, you know, be willing to, to reconcile any problem and all that, uh, that's justice, but God was merciful to us you see, and bestowed grace upon us. And so we, because we've had grace bestowed, are to bestow grace upon others, and that's mercy. Our mercy is grace. It isn't meeting someone halfway. It isn't doing your duty. It's what we read about, for example, in chapter 5, verses, well, verse 39. Here's, here's a demonstration of grace. Not just justice, not just doing your duty. He said, uh, verse 40 is what I want right now. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. See, that's going beyond what you're required to do. We're talking about grace and mercy. Whosoever shall, who shall compel thee to go one mile, go with him twain. Go with him two miles, you see. Now, we'll be dealing with these verses later, but uh, there, it still happens in the world today. Of course, in America, we, we have so little experience in so many things that are really uh, trials and real tests, like there have never been any foreign invaders on our shores and that sort of thing. So we really don't know what war or what death and horror really is. But... Uh, but Many places in the world, they still, armies and soldiers and leaders will compel you to work. They see you on the road, they'll compel you to carry a load and that sort of thing. And so he says here, because that was a common practice then, to compel someone to carry baggage or do something, like, you know, Simon the Cyrene was compelled to carry Jesus' cross for him. They just... Uh, uh, brought him into that, didn't ask his opinion, just said do it. He says if they compel you to go one mile, then don't lay your load down at the end of the mile, then go another mile and say the Lord bless you. You see, that's grace. You see, you've done what you were supposed to do, all right, now do more than you're supposed to do. Give to him that asketh thee, and for him, from him that borrow from thee, turn not thou away, and so forth. So we're talking about not justice, and treating a person fairly or just doing your duty or meeting a person halfway. You see, most Christians think if they do justly toward others, that is, if they do their duty, if they're legally just, that they've done their duty toward God, that is, fulfilled His requirement. But in the matter of interest, if you turn over the chapter, sixth chapter of Luke, take the matter of interest, Mercy is not only not charging. Mercy is not just charging legal interest, but mercy is not charging any. Now, we're talking about the difference between being legally right and mercy. You see, you can be legally right towards your brother, towards your neighbor. You can deal with a person in justice. You can do your duty toward them and still not demonstrate any love or mercy. You see, if, uh, if you don't step on my toes, I don't step on yours. If you, uh, if you borrow from me, uh, I will charge you a fair rate of interest. And uh, I'll be very, the interest rate is 6%, I'll charge you only 2%, you see. You're gonna be very just to this person. But mercy is in another realm entirely, dear friends, and unless spirit-filled Christians get a hold of the concept of mercy, then we're still going to be living uh, narrow little lives of dealing legalistically with one another and not really walking in the spirit at all. But he tells us in, Ma in Luke 6, verses uh, 30 to 36, Give to every man that asketh, Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. Do you know that was in the Bible? This is the Sermon on the Mount as recorded in Luke. It says they take your goods, don't ask them back. Hmm. Wonder if that would apply if they stole your car. 
awfully quiet in here. What if somebody took your money and you knew who had it? What would you do? You see, the principles of the of the Sermon on the Mount go far deeper than anything you're going to find in your Sunday school literature, dear friend. You're going to go far deeper than anything you've heard in your church. All you have to do is to read the Sermon on the Mount and you're going to wonder where in the world have you been? He says, if they take your goods, don't ask them. As you would that men do to you, do you also likewise. To them likewise. For if you love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? <clears throat> For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. Is he getting through to you? But look at verse 35. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. You see, you may not be ready, some of you, I don't know how many of you, I could say all of you or most of you, you may not be ready for the deeper things of the Spirit, but you don't have much time to get ready because uh, what Jesus is doing in this hour, he's going to do quickly. Amen. He's going to do a quick work and cut it short in righteousness. And <clears throat> whatever it is, whatever your hang-ups are, whatever your hassles are with the Word, are with the teachers of the Word because they tell you about it, I would suggest you just get on your knees and get rid of those as quickly as possible. Because Jesus is separating in this hour with his word those who are going on to total commitment, total faith, total everything, and those who are still just going to play church. You can have the baptism of the Holy Ghost and play church. And uh, make it when you can. And uh, uh, if something comes along that didn't particularly uh, edify you, you've heard it before or something, then you begin to grumble and complain and you didn't know that, that the walk in the Spirit is you're to come here to minister to the body. You're not to come here to be ministered to. If you get ministered to, well, praise the Lord. But if you don't, then praise the Lord that you could minister to us. Just by your presence, your praise, and no criticism, and no grumbling, and whatever it may be. And so we have just a short time to get a hold of these truths that he says mercy is what I'm calling you to. Mercy not only, mercy doesn't just charge legal interest. He says mercy doesn't charge any. Now, I can't help if you're in a business that charges interest. I, you just have to work that out. That isn't what I'm getting into. I'm getting into the principle of this thing. Amen. In fact, mercy goes beyond forgiving interest. Mercy forgives the debt, if need be. He said, lend, hoping to receive nothing again. Praise the Lord for the front row. We're getting some amens up here. Can you hear me back there? All right. Come on now, let's turn to Matthew 18. I want to, I'll say something to make some of you smile before I get done, but uh, it's too early to, to worry about that yet. <laughs> Uh, in Matthew chapter uh, 18 and verses 23 and following, we're not going to read the whole passage, but enough of it for you to get the idea <clears throat> that mercy is not doing your duty or being just toward another, another person and say, well, I fulfilled the requirements. Mercy goes completely beyond anything that you can conceive of and becomes pure grace and love. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven like unto a certain man certain king, which would take account of his servants, and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents, for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, 
and his children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. You see. <clears throat> but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which had owed him, you know, like a dollar, a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, <laughs> saying, Pay me that thou owest. Get the picture? <laughs> and the fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. The same thing he asked from the king. And he said, <clears throat> and he would not, but he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when the fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, <clears throat> O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all the debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth and delivered him unto the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. And so here's the perfect example of what will happen if God bestows mercy or grace upon us and we in turn do not bestow mercy and grace upon others. Mercy isn't just being just, meeting a person halfway, doing what is right, doing your duty. You should do that as a Christian. That's just basic. You can find people who are not even saved who will do that. They'll meet you halfway. I mean, they, they'll be honest and just with you. But a Christian, a spirit-filled Christian is called to go all the way. If they compel you to go a mile, then you go too. And, and do it in love. Do it because you want to. And he says, if a person borrows from you, don't be thinking in terms of getting it back or charging interest. He says, don't even think in terms of getting it back. If they give it back, all right, but you're not to be concerned about it. Praise God. I mean, when you lend, lend hoping not to get it again. And I, I've, I've had that experience where I would lend and uh, never hear of it again and praise the Lord. I mean, praise the Lord that I could help. <laughs> And I only say that to make a point. I wouldn't have said in a thousand years otherwise. But, uh, and I mean, I'm not working it up to try to feel good about it. I'm just glad to do it. Now, if you say, well, I'm going to touch him after the service, then, for a hundred dollar loan. Well, dear friend, if you could justify it, come ahead. If you're doing it on the basis of, of an easy touch, you probably find there are other principles in the Bible, too. <laughs> he said be as wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove and so um, that's right I said something like this once and a brother came right after service for a touch well I said brother you've been, you're a member of this church use your faith see I've been teaching faith and if you're just going to touch me then it means you don't believe the faith message believe for yourself but praise God, if you've got a need, why, uh, it's not something that we're telling you to do. It's something that we believe in, that, that charge you interest. I borrowed from a relative once, bless his heart, and he had me sign a note. Said, I'm not going to charge you interest, but we're going to put 6% on here just for a matter of record. Well, I, asked, I guess it was just because that Christians are bound to somehow exact even the satisfaction if they don't charge you interest of getting a note and you to sign it. Uh, not to even think in terms of getting your goods back or to get even or to have your way because you're right and you can prove it by the word or by uh, the law books or something else. Uh, he says if you're merciful, the reward's going to be what? You'll obtain mercy. You see, the, each of the Beatitudes, if you... Each of these principles, we call them Beatitudes, but they're really principles of conduct and character for the disciple who's going deeper with God. The reward is gratifying in every case. If you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, you won't have to look at pictures of food or listen to lectures on the chemistry of water. God will give you the exact thing you desire. He's not going to give you some box mix substitutes. Uh, he's not going to give you a program for power. He's not going to give you box mix religion. He's going to give you the real thing. If, if you want to go all the way, he'll give you 
what you're desiring. And if you are merciful, then you're going to obtain mercy. And you're not just going to obtain it out there. You're going to have mercy here and now. Praise God. God, God is so merciful to me. Is he merciful to you? Well, he'll be twice as merciful to you as you begin to express mercy to them. Now, dear friend, if you're sitting out there trying to figure out ways to get around the charging of interest or not charging of interest, you've missed the whole message. Uh, God doesn't set us in here to tell you how to work out your personal affairs. It's like people asking me, should I continue to take medicine after I've prayed for them? The very fact they ask means that they're not healed. And the very fact that you, you're wrestling whether or not uh, uh, how this is going to affect your real estate business or whatever you're in, I don't know what you're in or what you're not in. I'm talking about what your conduct should be toward others. The principle is here. Blessed are the merciful, and Jesus shows what mercy is. We just use interest as an illustration because he used it. He said, if they borrow your goods, then give to them, hoping for nothing again, not even the thing back that you've asked for. If they give it back, all right. And the Jews who did not have the Holy Spirit, they weren't under the dispensation of grace the Jews were required to forgive all debts every 50th year. And I mean if your brother barred from you the 49th year, the scriptures are clear, turn him not away, you see. Because if, if he borrowed and kept, say, and, and used the material, then he was gradually to give it back. But all debts were to be forgiven on the 50th year. If a man still owed you anything, it didn't mean they could borrow and not pay you, but if he owed you by the 50th, 50th year, then the goods stayed with him. You were, all debts were forgiven. Now the Jews did that under that economy. Certainly Christians can begin to have enough faith in God that he will supply their needs abundantly if they don't have to run around worrying about, well, I let someone have $100 or $10, uh, whether or not you should charge them interest, but forget the loan. Forget it. If they pay you back, fine. But you're not concerned. And if you walk in that kind of faith, God will multiply that $100 to you uh, over and over again. And as you are merciful to others, in this case, the lending of goods, it would apply to any need, then he said you shall obtain mercy. Well, praise God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Now, what's the promise here? You notice every one of the Beatitudes has a promise with it. They shall see God. Now here is what the deeper life is all about. If it's anything, it's purity of heart. The word in the Greek means to be clean. It's clean or pure in thoughts and words and deeds and motives and attitudes and affections. And the reason that you're blessed if you're pure in heart is because of what Jesus tells us in Matthew 15, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, whatever's in the heart's going to come out. It's going to be a, a revelation of your inner character. And if the deeper life is anything, it is purity of heart. Now, this is not a thing that, that is always easy to realize because you're living in Sodom. But purity of heart has to do with attitudes and motives and conduct. And in our walk, our progress into the deeper life that we have been teaching you here, this is where you come into the Holy of Holies because you see, uh, in the tabernacle in the Old Testament times in the wilderness, the Holy of Holies is where God dwells. And the promise is that if you're pure in heart, then you'll see God. Now, he means see God. He doesn't mean a, f that a figure of speech here that you will see God in his word or in nature or creation or something. But actually, those who are pure in heart, as we read at the beginning in Psalm 24, he says, they shall see God. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Now his holy place, who shall ascend in the hill of the Lord? That's Zion, Mount Zion, where the temple was. And who shall stand in his holy place? That's where God dwelt in the Old Testament tabernacle in the wilderness. You have the outer court. You've got the altar and the laver and then the holy place and then the holy of holies. Often in the Old Testament, the holy of holies is called the holy place, the most holy. 
translated the holy place. And as we taught you on Wednesdays over a period of several weeks and showed you the tabernacle and temple, how that a person, when they're unsaved, they're outside uh, uh, the uh, the enclosure. And then as they come to Christ, they have to go through the altar, by the way, to get to the Holy of Holies. This is where God is trying to bring us. And you see the cross in the Old Testament, in the temple, and in the tabernacle. And as they come through the altar, then the blood of the altar cleanses them from sin. The fire is on the altar, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then you have to come by way of the labor of water. And this is baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then on into the holy place where the lampstand, the revelation of the word was, the altar of incense which symbolizes our prayers and worship, and the table of showbread which is a symbol of course of God's supernatural and abundant provision for us, but that's as far as you could go with salvation and the baptism. You couldn't even get into the holy place without the baptism uh, as we showed you, but <clears throat> that's as far as you can go because there's a veil there. And the promise is that if you're pure in heart, then you can go into the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, and see God. And without, without this holiness and righteousness, then you see this veil is going to be there in your life. You'll not be able to see God. I mean, you won't see Him. You won't see Him in His Word. His Word will be obscured to you. You won't see Him as you pray. Nor will you see Him face to face in the sense of being brought into His presence in ways that, uh, that the Spirit-filled believer uh, has access that, that uh, we know of. Now, God's requirement in the Word is be ye holy as I am holy. He didn't say be ye holy as Paul was holy or be ye holy as, as uh, the saintly grandmother in your church is holy. Be ye holy as um, Justin Martyr was holy, or holy as some saint in the Bible, but be ye holy as I am holy. That's perfect holiness. First Peter chapter 1. For they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers. What's the reward? The promise they shall be called the children of God. Now, is your desire to make peace in a world of strife and war and bloodshed and confusion and resistance and, and uh, hate and strikes and so on, is it your desire to be a peacemaker? This has no reference to the United Nations and their efforts to make peace by leaving Christ out. You see, the only trouble with the United Nations and their efforts at world peace is they're trying to gain it by their own methods. And Jesus tells us in the Word there'll never be any peace on this earth anyway until He comes who is the Prince of Peace. <clears throat> now I don't mean you shouldn't pray for your country and your nation, but my friend you're deluded and deceived if you think things are going to get better. They're not going to get better, they're going to get worse. There can be a delay of judgments, but that's the best you can hope for. I mean, the word is already out. The time is at hand when the best you can do is intercede that God will delay judgments do America as well as this world and give us more grace and mercy that we might get this word out to others. Yes, he's going to do a great work in this end time. We're not ruling that out, but I'm talking about what I'm talking about, that there will be no peace in this world. And... If you've ever been to Sunday school a half a dozen times, you can see the scriptures teach that the world isn't going to get better, it's going to get worse. Read Matthew 24. Jesus' his last words to his disciples, expect the worst because it's going to get worse. He says things are going to get terrible. He says wars and rumors of wars and nation rising against nation and pestilence and earthquakes and floods and signs in the heavens and earth, things you've never heard of and men's hearts failing with fear because of the great uh, judgments uh, that are just uh, portents, announcements of what really is going to happen when the great tribulation comes. And so peace, my friends, if there's any peace, it's going to be in your life, in your heart, in your church, in your home. It's not going to be in this world. And so the calling is to make peace in your own heart. I will give him perfect, perfect peace whose mind has stayed on me. And everywhere we go around the country, Christians are no, no peace. 
You have to pray for them for deliverance from fears and oppressions and doubts and unbelief and, and um, preach yourself hoarse on the simple elements of faith and things that we ought to have been walking in years ago so we can go on to deeper things. You have to stop and just deal with elementary things in, in places where the Word has never been outside just the denominational Word. Baptist belief, Lutheran doctrine, and Episcopalian practices, and what have you. Uh, and so peace in your own mind. If you don't have that, don't try to minister peace to me. I mean, if you don't know peace. But he says he'll give you perfect peace. You'll keep your mind stayed on him, Isaiah 26.3. And then promote peace with all you come in contact with. You see, Jesus says this is the active side of your total commitment to him to be a peacemaker you see you can't make peace in this world but you can make peace with your brothers and sisters and that sort of thing and strife in the church or in your marriage is not peace you're supposed to promote peace uh, where you're living where you are where you worship where you work but there's a passive side of peacemaking that we claim with this brother that he could enter into that, you see, and so he's not going off to blow somebody's head off and say, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were a Christian, but Christians kill one another just like non-Christians. You know, if I had no reason, dear friend, to be opposed to uh, murdering one another, and uh, don't, uh, don't try to read anything into what I'm saying, but I, that would be enough justification for me not to want to take someone's life because we have the anomalous situation and have had it for centuries throughout the world of brothers killing brothers Christians killing Christians because uh, we sign up we just happen to be born in Spain or we happen to be born in France we happen to be born in America where we're at war with someone else and you have brothers killing brothers uh, this ought not to be this has nothing to do with the duty and responsibility of the nation to protect us. And uh, we'll save that till we get to it. No, we're not pacifists. We're what he said in verse 30, 38. Now, <clears throat> that's why you need your Bible, so you can see it's there. You have heard. This is your Lord speaking. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? All right. Some of you didn't say anything. Maybe you're not. I mean, don't say you are if you're not. Then this is your Lord speaking. This isn't Hobart Freeman, his ideas, and some pacifistic uh, concept. Uh, pacifism and non-resistance are incompatible. They have nothing to do with one another. These peace marches and all of that is not what we're talking about. That's not Bible. We're talking about non-resistance, what he teaches. He says, but I say unto you that you resist not evil. Oh, verse 38 first. You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was the Old Testament law. But I, your Lord, say unto you that you resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, friends, you don't need an interpreter and a commentary or anyone else to tell you what that means. It means just exactly what it says. Don't try to spiritualize it. If you get slapped on the one cheek, turn the other cheek. And then he says, I tell you not to resist evil against you. Now, surely we don't have to get out into primary Sunday school teaching and say that he's not talking about resisting the evil one Satan when he's coming against you with his symptoms and lies and deceit but he's talking about evil against you don't you resist it you can conjure up all sorts of ideas well if everybody felt that way then the communists would take over this nation if we well dear friends if everybody obeyed Jesus the communists couldn't even get within a thousand miles of this nation <laughs> Oh, you don't have to worry about it. God told Israel, said, if you'll just obey me, he said, there'll be no nation can stand against you. He said, one man will put a thousand to flight. <laughs> Hallelujah. The trouble was, Israel, like the church, does not take God literally at his word. Now, this is the whole area of non-resistant. Don't try resistance. If you've never heard about it, and most, most haven't, don't try to settle it on the 
basis of one session in faith assembly this morning. Uh, we've got a whole detailed study on it in the Deeper Life in the Spirit book. You'll see there's absolutely no relationship between non-resistance and pac pacifism. Pacifism is for non-Christians. Non-resistance is for a Christian. It's the passive side of his Christian character. The active side, he makes peace. The passive side, he doesn't defend himself. See, only a Christian can do that. I mean, only a Christian can come close to doing that. Only a Christian filled with the Spirit can really do it. It's where you are reviled and, and mistreated and, and persecuted and evil done toward you. And don't think, dear friends, as I say, this comes out of some little tract or commentary we've read. These things come out of experience as well as the Word of God. We, we practice what we preach. Oh, we're not perfect. But I'll tell you, we're, we're, we're working at it because that is what he says in verse 48 of chapter 5. Be ye therefore perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And he doesn't mean be you perfect as you try to be perfect or want to be perfect or someone else is perfect. He said be you perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And he concludes that section, that is the conclusion of saying your Father does good to those who despise him and who do not worship him. And the evil ones, he does good to them. He makes the rain and the sun to shine on them just as he does those who are his, ch his children. He said, if you want to be God's child, then you, you act like God toward your enemies and toward those who do evil toward you. Oh, well, this isn't, as I say, this isn't the message of the hippies and the peace movements and the band, the bombs and all of that. I want to tell you, you need some of you to do some study in this area from the scriptures. You'll find God says the nation has a responsibility to defend its citizens. God gives them the sword and puts it in their hand to defend them because we're living in, defend their citizens because we're living in a sinful world. This isn't the kingdom of God on earth yet. But it's one thing for the nation to have that responsibility. It's another thing for a Christian to return evil for evil just because uh, the government or someone requires him to do it. And uh, as I say, we'll have to save that for when we get over to this section in itself. But uh, I, just, uh, I just pick up in my spirit many times when I use the name term non-resistance. You can pick up in your spirit the static that's out in the audience, you know. <laughs> and so we said all of that ahead of time to say it means what it says. Blessed are the peacemakers. He said it, I didn't. He said, don't return evil for evil. It used to be in the Old Testament dispensation, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You knock my eye out, uh, Russia will knock your eye out. He's talking to Christians. He isn't talking to the government. The government can't do this. An uh, unsaved man can't obey this. This is for the man or the woman that's in Christ and filled with the Spirit. And if you find, I'm just going to go all the way this morning because I may not see you again or for a while some of you I'm going to go all the way this morning and I say if you find any resistance in your heart for what he said then you have another spirit that's motivating that doesn't mean you can't have the Holy Spirit but you've got another spirit that you need to get delivered of and you can deliver yourself because you can't resist a message of peace and justify it on the basis of what you got taught in your history class in school or what you're taught over the TV. Uh, we're not talking about patriotism. The man is patriotic who obeys the Lord and prays for his leaders and his nation and binds up their wounds and does the things that a Christian will do. I mean, there are more patriots many times who are praying for their nations than the person's out blowing somebody's head off. And he's there by duress because he's compelled. He got drafted. And uh, he doesn't want this at all. And the man who's praying is doing it because he wants to. So that's what I call patriotism anyway. Let's, let's take it the Bible way. Some of you, dear friends, need to get this book off of your shelf. You've paid, what, a dollar and a half for it. <laughs> Dust it off and start reading it. Bless your heart, I've run into people. She said, well, I've never gotten beyond the first chapter yet. And another woman said, I just can't get it finished. I go back and keep rereading the first part. Well, sometime finish it up because there's page after page on Jesus' teaching concerning non-resistance. What he says about it, what the Word says, and you'll find it's not what you were taught. You see, I wasn't born into this view. I came up as a good old fighting Baptist. 
And I mean, if you're not a fighter, you're not a Baptist. <laughs> and business meeting, we look forward to it with relish. <laughs> See who was going to, which side was going to win. <clears throat> I know what goes on in your churches. I've pastored them. I've been in them for 22 years. And uh, that just happens not to be what Jesus taught. But I, as I say, I didn't come into this because my family teaches it. Bless his heart. <laughs> my, my, uh, well, I'll just say my relatives. <laughs> my relatives think I'm crazier than maybe some of you do. But that's what he said. I said to one brother once when the Lord had shown me this truth about non-resistance, and I wasn't argued into it. It's just plain as day. I didn't know what to do with it as a Baptist because I knew what it said, and I knew Baptists didn't practice that. And, uh, oh, he just couldn't stand that when I told him, you know, an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth is legalism. That's the Old Testament law. Now it's turned the other, oh, my, you can't do that, and strikes and all of that. Well, I said, what would you do as a Christian if your plant was on strike? And uh, they had the uh, picket line there. Uh, uh, would you force your way through? He said, I'd get in any way I can. I said, would you fight to get in? Now, he's a good Baptist Christian. He said, I'd get in any way I can. I said, would you knock a fella down to get in to go to work? See, he doesn't believe in strikes. He's right there. Uh, in case you don't know that, uh, that's also Bible. And in fact, that even came before Jesus. That was John the Baptist. He told the soldiers, they said, what must we do now that we've been baptized unto repentance? He said, be content with your wages. <laughs> that wasn't in your quarterly? Well, it's in this one. The one they asked John the Baptist, now that we are disciples and looking forward to Christ, what should we do as soldiers? He says, don't defraud anyone and be content with your wages. Don't mistreat anyone, he said, and be content with your wages. Told a soldier, don't mistreat anybody. And so I said, would you knock a man down? He said, I'd get in any way I could. He didn't believe in strikes. He said, I'm going to work if they strike because I don't believe in all this promotion of strikes. But he, he, he was a fighting Baptist. And I said, would you kill a man to get in? He said, I'd get in any way I could. Well, I said, brother, you don't know. You don't know the message of Jesus Christ. I mean, <laughs> you don't undo one wrong to do another. And so he's talking here about making peace with yourself, with your neighbor, with every man. As far as you're concerned, Paul said, as far as you're concerned, live peaceably with all men. He tells us in Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 12, he said, follow after holiness and peace with all men without which no man will see God. Do you hear that? Follow after holiness and peace with all men without which no man will see God. If you think you can battle your way through this life and see God, then you're going to have to cope with the Scriptures about it because the Scriptures tell you in Hebrews 12 and verse 15 that, that you can't do it. Holiness and peace mark the disciple of Jesus Christ. It's what characterizes him. And sometimes you're going to have to fight with yourself and fight with the devil, not to fight with people, but go ahead and do it. It's safer. <laughs> Some Christians think they're called to defend their doctrine on the basis of Jude 3. Contend earnestly for the faint faith that was delivered once for all to the saints. Contend. And they like that word contend. And so they run around contending. And people get the baptism. They contend for the baptism. So I told one brother you can't argue people into the Holy Spirit he just loves to debate things and that's a contentious spirit friends even when it's about the word you can't argue people into faith people come to me all the time want to know what to tell people give me a good answer for them here's the last answer they gave me on my uh, approach to them now what's a good answer to that well I said brother you're not called our sister you're not called to defend the faith you're not called to argue your doctrine you're not called to argue people into faith. I said, you can't do that. I said, just give them your testimony. Tell them what happened. You don't have to answer every question. 
What about Paul's thorn, they said. I'm hung up on that. They'll accept divine healing if you can explain that. I said, if you explain Paul's thorn, they'll have Job's boils for next week. <laughs> and after you answer Job's boils, they'll have Epaphroditus. I said, give them the positive promises. That's what I do. I show them the promises of healing, not alleged proof text for sickness. Why run to the Word to try to prove why you ought to be sick? Go to the Word and find the promises for healing and for the baptism. I've seen people filled with the Spirit who wanted to debate the doctrine, you know, and I wouldn't debate it. I'd said, let me show you the promises. You show them the promises, and then they accept those and receive. Then they're the best argument. They are their own best argument that they were wrong. You see, you don't have to convince a person if they'll accept the plain word of God. If he says he'll give you the Holy Spirit, if you ask him, then just ask him. Forget 1 Corinthians 12, 13, or what you've been taught in your church or commentary. Ask him and get it, and then you'll know that you've got it, and it's valid, and, and then you can go back and, and uh, help someone else with the promises and not the arguments. Well, he says, if you make peace, the promise is you'll get peace. He said you'll be called... Where are we? They, you'll be called the children of God. Why? Because the children of God and only the children of God are peacemakers. You see, the Prince of Peace, Jesus, He is called the Prince of Peace. The, he is the Son of God and we'll be called sons of God if we're peacemakers. Uh, if you turn that around and you are a troublemaker and a war maker, how could you be called a child of God? You see, friends, you don't need anyone to teach you the plain meaning of what it says. If you're a peacemaker, you're a child of God. You'll be called a child of God. Well, praise the Lord. We're going to save the real blessings for next time. Blessed are they which are persecuted. <laughs> How about that? They teach that in your church? Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs, the same promise as before, the kingdom of heaven. You say, well, what if I'm not persecuted? Well, yours isn't the kingdom of heaven. Now, you have to distinguish between being chastened for your sins and mistakes and persecution for righteousness' sake. You see the key? Now, I want to tell you right now, dear friend, I, I want to tell you, Plainly, if you're not persecuted for righteousness' sake in some form, you're, you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Now, there are levels of persecution, degrees, and kinds. But if you've never felt it, <clears throat> whether it's ridicule or some form of oppression, then you better check up on your righteousness. And then he said in verse 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. You're blessed. When they persecute you, when they say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You're blessed if you're persecuted. Well, to see what that means, I guess you'll just have to come back. <laughs> I'll tell you, some of us, it might help to come back because... There's a great distinction between suffering chastisement because of spiritual <clears throat> or religious stubbornness or spirit of strife or blindness or whatever it may be. There's a great difference in suffering chastisement for those reasons than suffering for Jesus' sake or suffering for righteousness', righteousness sake. I mean, when you're suffering for righteousness' sake, you won't have to be praying all night, Lord, is, is this something you're trying to teach me? Or is it because I've been faithful? You have to know the difference, friend, or you don't know when to resist the enemy and when to submit to the persecution, you see. Sometimes you may have to get straightened up in your own life to get rid of what you thought was persecution. And when it leaves, you'll find out it wasn't persecution. It was just the old self that was still alive in that area. But he said, if you're suffering for righteousness or for my sake, then he said, you're blessed. And you start rejoicing. I know what it is to rejoice in the midst of those experiences. I wonder if you do. Well, God help us to see it. I'm going to encourage you to come tonight. We're going to be ministering a word on positive confession.
the title to one of our books I don't see up here, but uh, <laughs> Positive Confession. You know, you can get to the place where you can use your faith and confess a lot of times the right things, but sometimes we're still being bound by what we say and what we think. You see, it isn't always what comes out of the mouth, it's what you're thinking in relationship to the one who can read thoughts, God himself. And if you're out here positive confessing to us and in, your, in the thought realm you're wondering and doubting and raising uh, questions about God's faithfulness, integrity of his word, or feeling sorry for yourself, you see, he reads thoughts like we hear words. So let's get our confessing into maturity because we get what we confess. Romans 10.10. 10. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, we ask in Jesus' name that the word of righteousness might permeate every heart and mind, that it might fill us to overflowing. Father, we know it's the Word that's going to purge out everything that binds and hinders us from coming into maturity. So let this Word work in us as, as a cleansing uh, process this morning, rooting out all of the little roots of bitterness and evil and self that are still in our hearts, bringing into focus the face of Jesus Christ, so that as we see him, we'll become more and more like him. Let the word reveal him who is our life, our love, our joy, our peace, our all. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we bless you, Jesus. Let thy word dwell in our hearts. Blessed be the Lord, hallelujah.